The PAT or Physics Aptitude Test includes a range of questions. This video is going to explore some examples to help demonstrate how to approach them. My name is Sam, and this is Oxcentric. If you haven't already watched part 1 where I introduce the PAT and give some tips and tricks, I'd recommend watching that first. I've chosen some questions from the 2019 and 2018 papers that I feel summarise the variety of the PAT. These are most reflective of the current style of problem. I'm going to put the question on screen briefly for you to pause the video and give it a try, if you want, before I start my explanation. Without further ado, let's get started. Solve the following equation for x. e to the x plus 9 divided by e to the minus x plus 5 is equal to 2. So straight off in this question we can see it's quite a standard mathematical question, but the one word we need to see is the solve, so that immediately makes us think about solving a quadratic equation. Now, looking at what we've got here, the first thing that I want to change is the fact that we have e to the minus x plus 5 as a denominator, which would make things quite messy to work with. So what we're first going to do is multiply both sides by e to the minus x plus 5 so that we can expand this and get it in a more linear form. Alright, so now we're going to rearrange to give e to the x minus 1 minus 2 e to the minus x is equal to 0. Now the other thing I don't like is the fact that we have this e to the minus x, which could make it quite tricky to solve this. So what we're going to do is multiply through by e to the x, so giving us e to the 2x minus e to the x minus 2 is equal to 0. Now this very much resembles the form of a quadratic just in e to the x. So we can factorise this, e to the x minus 2 multiplied by e to the x plus 1 is equal to 0. So that gives us two solutions for e to the x, so e to the x equals 2 and e to the x is equal to minus 1. Now let's check the validity of these solutions. So if e to the x is equal to 2, then x is equal to ln2, which is a perfectly valid solution. However, if e to the x is equal to minus 1, x would be equal to ln of minus 1, which in fact does not exist, as you can only take a natural log of a number greater than 0. Therefore, x is equal to ln2 is our only valid solution. In an imaginary water filtration process, a fraction of 1 over n of an impurity is removed in the first pass of the water through the system. In each succeeding pass, the amount of impurity removed is 1 over n of the amount removed in the preceding pass. Show that if n is equal to 2, the water can be made arbitrarily pure, but if n is equal to 3, then at least half of the impurity will remain. So we're only really considering two cases here, and those are the cases where n is equal to 2 and n is equal to 3. Let's consider the case where n is equal to 2 first. So in our first pass, we remove half of the impurity. In our second pass, we remove half of that half. So that would be 1 quarter. In our third, we remove half of that quarter, 1 eighth, and so on. So what you might notice is that these terms actually follow a geometric series. So they're all multiplying by the same scalar factor, which is half. Now ultimately, we want to find the sum of the fraction of impurities removed, and there are some formulae we can use for the sum of a geometric series. So that is the sum to the nth value, which is equal to a multiplied by 1 minus r to the minus n, and then divided by 1 minus r, and the sum to infinity, which is equal to a over 1 minus r. So as we're considering what we could theoretically do with an infinite number of passes, this is the formula we're going to want to use. So our first term is a, and that is equal to a half, and our ratio, as we said here, is also equal to a half. So therefore, the sum to infinity is equal to one half over one half, which is equal to one. So therefore, as a fraction of the impurity, 1 is equal to 100% of the impurity. Therefore, when n is equal to 2, the water can be made arbitrarily pure. 
because we've removed all of the impurity. Now let's consider that other case which is n is equal to 3. So that would be 1 third, then 1 third of that third, 1 ninth, 1 over 27 and so on. So we can use the exact same logic except our ratio this time is a third and our first term is also a third. So we can sum that into the infinity formula. 1 third over 1 minus a third is equal to 1 third of 2 thirds which is equal to 1 half. So that means at max we can only remove half of the impurity. Therefore if we can only remove half at max then half is going to remain and therefore what we stated in the question is true. And we have therefore proven that at least half the impurity will remain even after infinite passes. In the circuit shown below, all resistors have the same resistance R and the light bulb has a fixed resistance. You wish to change the state of the switches so that the brightness of the bulb increases from its minimum to its maximum. Which sequence of switch states will achieve this? So the first thing we need to consider is the condition for the lamp to be its brightest. So when the lamp is brightest, it has the biggest power output, which means it has the biggest voltage, and therefore means that this resistor network here has the least resistance. And therefore, we also know that when the lamp is at its dimmest, the resistor network here has its greatest resistance. So there are three possible options, when A is closed, when B is closed, and when both are closed. So let's consider branch A first and gets into a more workable form. So this has a single resistor and then we have two identical resistors in parallel. So for these two resistors in parallel we need to use the parallel resistor law which is 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 is equal to 1 over RT. So 1 over R plus 1 over R is equal to 2 over R, therefore meaning that 1 over RT is equal to 2 over R, and therefore RT is equal to R over 2 for that particular parallel section. Now that means we can rewrite this section of the circuit as so, where that is R and that is R over 2. Now we also know that for resistors in series, the resistance total is equal to R1 plus R2 and so on, and they add linearly. So that means that the total resistance of path A is 3 over 2R, which is R plus R over 2. So that's total resistance of path A. Path B is even easier to work out because it's literally just two resistors, one after another in series. So that has a resistance of 2R. So now for path AB, you could do the maths, however, we know that for a parallel circuit, the resistance of the total circuit is always less than the resistance of the smallest resistor. So for this particular parallel circuit, our smallest resistor would be 3 over 2R and the other one would be 2R. So therefore the resistance of when A and B are closed is always less than the resistance of either A or B. So therefore in terms of the greatest resistance to the smallest, B closed, then a closed, then both A and B closed is the order. So therefore, we go to our multiple choice and we know that the answer is going to be C. The diagram below shows an interferometer with two paths, path A and path B, which a wave can take from its source S to a detector D. The lengths of the paths differ by an amount L which can change with time. The intensity at the detector I is measured and varies as a function of L as follows. I is equal to IP plus IQ cos KL. In the above, K is the wave number of the wave which relates to the wavelength lambda via K is equal to 2 pi over lambda. IP and IQ are constants. Sketch the intensity as a function of L in the range from 0 to 2 lambda. Label both axes and identify IP and IQ in the sketch. Alright, so ultimately what we're trying to do here is sketch this function of intensity against length. 
So the first thing I think we should do to make things easier is substitute in our value of k from here. So i is equal to ip plus iq cos 2 pi over lambda l. So let's analyze what this graph could look like. So the first thing I notice is we've got a function of cos. So this means that it's going to be a standard cosine wave and we've not got any other plus or minuses here to shift it left or right. However, we have got a scalar factor of IQ here and also this will affect at what point it reaches the minima and maxima. In addition to that, we've got this IP which will shift the entire function up or down. So ultimately, what our cos element would look like would be a little like this. And also we know that the values of cos are maximum and minima of one and minus one. So therefore IQ and minus IQ would be the maximum and minima of that particular bit of the function. But we can't be quite sure at what values these minima and maxima will lie yet. So let's consider that now. So for the minima and maxima, across the range, it might be useful to consider how many repeats we have before we exactly decide the maxima. So our length is from 0 to 2 lambda. Now, when we substitute in, for example, L is equal to lambda, that means that we're putting 2 pi into our cosine function. Now, cosine repeats every 2 pi. So if I consider our maximum length is 2 lambda, that means that our maximum input would be 4 pi. So this means overall that in our graph, our cos wave is actually going to repeat twice. Now, we can start to consider the maxima and minima. So we've established here that lambda would correspond to 2 pi and 2 lambda would correspond to 4 pi. Now, from the nature of cos, we know that at 0, 2 pi, 4 pi, and so on, we will have maxima. So therefore, lambda, 0, and 2 lambda, sorry, are going to be our maxima. We also know there are going to be minima, which we would expect to lie halfway between these. But also, we can double check this because if we input pi into our cosine function, then we would uh, get cos as minus 1. And to do that, we would do lambda over 2 or 3 lambda over 2, which would be minima. So they would produce pi and 3 pi. So now we're getting some pretty good ideas. And the last thing we need to consider is this translation upwards. So we think our curve would look a little like this. However, when you translate it up, it means that IP plus IQ is our maxima on intensity, and IP minus IQ is our minima on intensity. So I think we have all the elements here to actually start drawing. So we're going to have our length on this axis and our intensity on this one. So we know that our, I'm just going to extend it a little bit. So we've got minima at lambda over 2, maxima at lambda, minima at 3, lambda over 2, and maxima at 2 lambda. And our intensity, the maxima is IP plus IQ. Our minimum is IP minus IQ. And in between that, we expect IP. And also, we know that we would expect our intensity not to go below zero. So that's why we've drawn this graph as such. From here, it's just a matter of drawing on a pretty standard cosine wave. So up here, back to our maxima here, down here, and up here. So there we go, that is our graph drawn. And part two of the question, which is to indicate the biggest change in length we can unambiguously infer from a measurement of intensity. So as a function, cosine is what we call a many to one function, where many values could correspond to a single value. So for example, if I wanted to choose uh, IP plus IQ, we've got at least three values where this could correspond. So 
the longest length we can unambiguously infer is the furthest point along where it is still a one-to-one -one function. So we can be confident that if we pick a point, it must only be um, on this curve here. So this point here, lambda over two, is where it starts to loop up again, and therefore where it becomes a many-to-one function. Instead of just a one-to-one, -one, if we restrict the range from zero to lambda over two. So therefore we can mark on this point as the maximum and therefore we can say that the maximum length we can unambiguously infer is lambda over two as any other length in this range before this is a slightly smaller length. Which combination of units is the odd one out? So we're given five sets of units here, and we have to decide which one is the odd one out. So let's first consider A. So that's Coulomb volts per meter. So Coulomb, that's the unit for charge. Volt, that's the unit for voltage. Meter is a unit for length or distance. Now, charge multiplied by voltage. We know a formula for this, and that is E is equal to QV. So therefore, Coulomb volts as a unit is equivalent to joules. So therefore, that means that our units for A, Coulomb volts per meter, are equivalent to joules per meter. Now, we can also consider another formula that might help simplify things. E, or work done, is equal to the force multiplied by the distance. And we can rearrange this to say the force is equal to the work done or energy divided by the distance. And now if we're looking at our units, joules per meter, that's energy divided by a distance. So therefore, that means that this would be equivalent to the units for a force. And using F is equal to MA, the units for a force are kilograms meters per second to the minus two. So therefore, those are equivalent to the units to A. Let's consider B next. So that is amp Tesla meters. So amp, that's the units for current. Tesla, that's the units for magnetic flux density. And meters is a unit for length. So a formula that would encompass all of these is the formula F is equal to BIL. And as we know, these units would basically match up. So B would be Tesla, I would be current, and M would be length. Therefore, we can say that B is again representing a force. So the units are equivalent to kilograms meters per second to the minus two. C is already in this form, so C is basically trivial. D is joules per meter, and oh look, we've already dealt with this one earlier, and we've said that that's equivalent to kilograms meters per second to the minus two. Now, we've only got one more left, and that's E. And by this point, because all the first four have been the same, we can probably deduce that E will be the odd one out. However, if you do want to check, then we can see that it's Coulomb meters per second. Now, Coulombs per second is equivalent to current or amps. So therefore, the units for E are equivalent to amp meters. And if we compare the units for E and B, one is amp meters and the other is amp tesla meters. They're very clearly different things. So if B matches with all the other four so far, then E must be a different one. So therefore, the odd one out is E. So, that concludes my exploration of the PAT. This exam is not meant to be easy, however with enough practice you can succeed. Remember to keep calm, look for the concepts you know and thoroughly explain your workings. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe for more content. With usual- ah! I can't speak!